some of you will know this, some of you will not know this. I work with an organization called the Messi Trust. Uh, it's been in this city for over 20 years now, uh, really doing amazing things, uh, impacting the communities, prisons, schools, all kinds of stuff. Believe you or not, I'm employed to pray. I get paid to pray. <laughs> So uh, I, I, I spend a lot of time in the prayer room. I spend a lot of time leading prayer meetings, uh, mobilizing prayer for the ministry because missions and prayer are not supposed to be disconnected. Actually, they go hand in hand. So uh, what I do with the Messy Trust is I mobilize for prayer within the ministry with the members of staff. But something else I do as well that you've probably heard of is Prayer Storm. And the vision of Prayer Storm is to mobilize the youth of the nation to a lifestyle of intercession. I feel weird wearing a suit and preaching, actually. <laughs> I don't think I've actually done this before. Okay, so the vision of prayer storm <laughs> is to mobilize the youth of the nation to a lifestyle of intercession. And that came out of a series of encounters I had with God. And uh, Joel 2.28 says, in the last days I pour my spirit on all flesh. Actually, no, the first word in Joel 2.28 says, afterwards. After what? Joel 2 says, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, call a fast. Let the people of God come and weep before God and cry out to him for their nation. Okay, and then it says afterwards, after the fasting, after the weeping, after the mass mobilization of the people of God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That promise is connected to some principles. So this next prayer storm we're doing, we've got one coming up on the 30th of November. We're calling for a day of fasting and prayer for the nation. So I want to encourage you to join us. I've not got a video yet. I'm, gonna, I'm working on it. So I want to encourage you to put the dates in your diary. Join us for seven hours uh, from uh, 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. We've got different worship teams. We've got different prayer leaders all across the nation. And it's going to be a storm. I know it. <laughs> We're preparing for a storm in the heavens and to see God's kingdom breaking upon this nation like never before. The prophecy in Joel 2, 28 says, I pour my spirit on all flesh. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. My dad came to this nation with a, with a, actually with a dream that God gave him. And in that dream, he had a picture. Of, I, I, I'll call it more vision. He had a picture of what we're doing right now at prayer storm, and he actually thought he was going to do that. But as the years have gone by, I've been here since 2001, it turns out God is working that out through me. I wasn't planning to do what I'm doing right now. It just happens that this is God's plan for me. So realize my dad had a dream. I saw the vision. <laughs> Old men dream dreams, young men see visions. And I'm realizing that the outpouring of God in these last days is multi-generational. It's not just the young people going off doing their own thing. It's not just the old people thinking they know everything and doing it by themselves. It's the connection of the generations. And we're going to see the outpouring of God like we've never seen before. So what we do with Prayer Storm is trying to mobilize people, especially the youth. It's not exclusive to the youth, but we're trying to mobilize the youth to gather together to pray. Because as I, as I started giving myself to prayer, I was thinking, where are the young people? Most of the prayer meetings I went to was older, older women, no men, and no young people. I mean, it's different in this church. But a lot of prayer meetings I went to was like, you know, where are the youth? They need to begin to carry the burden of intercession for their schools, for their universities, wherever God takes them. Because that is the track. It's like a train track. That is the, tr that is the track the train is going to travel on, the train of God's move. We have to lay down the track of prayer and intercession. We have to go into the spirit realm and prepare the way through prayer and fasting for what God wants to do. I'm going to move on. See, prophets are forged in the deserts of fasting, not the deserts of feasting. Prophets of the nature of John the Baptist. Who was John the Baptist? He didn't raise the dead. He didn't heal the sick, but he turned the nation to God. When he preached, there was conviction on the masses. And people came and started getting baptized. And he prepared the way for the greatest move of God in that generation and ever actually, Jesus. He prepared the way for Jesus, which is a type of revival. And Jesus comes and prophesies and says, the spirit of Elijah that rested upon John is still going to come again. There's a, there's a promise for that. In Matthew 17, 11 or 19, 11, I think it is. Jesus says, Elijah is coming again, and I believe the spirit that rested upon John is going to rest upon a generation. And just like John fasted and prayed for the first move, which was Jesus coming into a nation and coming to the world and changing the history of the planet, another generation is going to rise up with the same spirit of Elijah upon them. They will look like John in how they give themselves to God, in their radical devotion to God, and they're going to prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus. Are you with me? But they're going to be just as radical as John was. They're going to fast. They're going to pray. They're going to seek God. And this is one of those seasons we're in where I feel God is just stirring things up in the church. It's challenging me. It's challenging people. It's like, we've got to give more. We can't afford to be complacent. You know, playtime is over now. 
It says in Isaiah 60, Pastor Paul's uh, life uh, chapter, a uh, life, uh, uh, yeah, life chapter, really. You know, uh, darkness is covering the earth. Great darkness, the people. And we're living at a time where, whether I don't know if you can discern it. And sometimes we get so, what's the word, um, caught up in the what's going on in the nation and what's going on on TV and what's going on in our personal lives. And you don't realize that darkness is increasing. It's darker now than it was 10 years ago. And it's darker now than it was 70 years ago. What we watch on TV and are okay with right now, if the people who lived 80 years ago were to live in this moment, they'll be like, I can't believe you're accepting this as okay. Because we've been desensitized to the increase of the darkness because we're just caught up in it. My wife and I went to the cinema the other day and we had to walk out of the cinema because I couldn't believe what 15, 15, what you watch on a 15, I'm like, this cannot be 15. The darkness is, is the filth, the language, everything is just getting worse and worse. But the Bible says as the darkness increases, so will the glory of God increase. The glory of God is going to increase upon the people of God because light shines brightest when it's darkest. And this is the hour for the people of God to rise up, okay, and begin to position themselves with everything, give everything they have to God, no compromise, no kind of one leg in the church, one leg in the world, kind of playing the game, you know. It's time to be focused so that God can do through us what he wants to do through us. I'm going to say this and I'm going to move on. I think many of us just put all the responsibilities on the pastors to do all the work. In Ephesians, it says he's given the fivefold ministry, the pastor, the prophet, the teacher, the evangelist, the apostle. He's given those gifts to the body of Christ to equip the people so that the people will do the work of the ministry. You're supposed to do the work of the ministry at school. You're supposed to do the work of the ministry on your job. It's not just Pastor Paul's responsibility, and it's just not my responsibility because I'm standing on this platform. The people who speak on this platform are equipping you to go into your neighborhoods and your workplaces to do the work of the ministry. So this is no longer a one-man show. You are a revivalist. Whether you feel it or no, you have to see yourself as that. I'm telling you. Listen, if I were to say to you next week you're going you're gonna to speak on this platform, I can guarantee you this week coming up you're probably going to pray more. You're probably going to want to seek God and say, God, what are you saying? Well, the question is, why do you have to pray more and seek God more when you have to stand on a platform to speak? Because you feel impacted by the weight of the responsibility to deliver a word from God. Well, why do you have to wait for someone to tell you you have to speak to feel that responsibility? Right now, you are responsible for the people God has placed around you that do not know God. You're responsible to pray for them. You're responsible to deliver the word of God to them. That's how we're going to change this nation. We're not going to change this nation just by a guy praying on the platform, God is going to use that, but we're going to change this nation when you, on your job, in your school, in your workplace, you're beginning to be a witness for God. You don't wait for anyone to give you an opportunity to preach the gospel. You ask God for opportunities. You intercede for your workplace. You walk into that place earlier than everyone else. You pray and you claim that place for God. You say, Father, this place is your territory. I declare that hearts receive the gospel in this place. Every hardness begin to break away and you begin to gain ground in intercession. I believe in the power of prayer. Because it softens, it, it softens the hearts of people to receive the gospel. It's not about how well you can communicate the gospel. There are amazing communicators in this generation. But that's not what we need right now. We need the breaking through of the spirit of God. That's not dependent on the gift of man. And only through prayer can we lay that track for that move to come. Are you with me? This morning, I want to share a word that I feel is a word for me in, a, in this season, I mean, because I've just had a few experiences that, you know, and sometimes this happens to me where, you know, God gives me a word and I have a series of encounters or experiences that just made me realize this is a word for this season. And uh, just catch my breath for a moment. <laughs> Someone said to me, I talk too fast. I don't know why. It's like I'm trying to get all everything in my mind out. It's like, oh, you know. Have you seen The Matrix? You saw when that lady drove the helicopter. In one instance, she was able to ride that helicopter that would have taken someone years to do. I believe in the presence of God. You can receive a download just like that. <laughs> and things that would take you 50 years in, in one minute, God just downloaded it to you. You're like, gosh, how did I know that? And sometimes when I'm speaking, I feel like I want to almost burst all that word out and just, just get it, get it, go out and do it. I, I, am, I, am, I, am I making sense? <laughs> Anyway, so this word, I was speaking this summer at uh, several youth uh, uh, things, you know, like New Wine, and there's another one called One Event. Um, and um, before I went, actually, I was having an all-night prayer meeting with a friend of mine. And as we were praying, he kind of like just said to me, James, I really feel God's, God's saying this. 
And the word he felt God was saying was, James, if we focus, God's going to do great and mighty things. I repeat, I says, if we focus, God's going to do great and mighty things. And, things. and I remember thinking, you know, I need to make a note of this word. Because I started realizing it's not just good enough to hear prophetic words. It's good to note them, write them down. When you bear witness with them, because there'll be times you'll need to go back to them. And refer, well, God, you said this. But it wasn't until a day or two later I was speaking at this event. And I woke up in the morning, and all I could just feel, I could just, it's like, it's not like I heard the audible voice of God, but I just woke up with one word on my heart, and I couldn't get rid of it. But I knew it was a word from God. It wasn't what I was going to be speaking on that day, but it was just resounding in me. And the word was consecrate, consecrate. So I was just like, wow, I feel like God is really calling me to a season of consecration, you know. So I was meditating on this during the, during the day, and then I met with a friend of mine, at, at this conference, it's like, James, what do you feel God's saying? And I was like, well, as of this morning, I just heard this word consecrate, and I feel like God's calling me to the, and I feel like this is what this is going to look like in my life. So we're just discussing that, and then say, that's funny you said that, because God is giving me this word in Joshua 3.5. You can turn there if you want to. It's, um, it's Joshua says to the people, now this is my friend saying this to me, he says, Joshua, Joshua says to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. When he said that, that triggered the word that I just heard the day before or so from my friend when we're praying. If you, he says, consecrate yourselves, Joshua 3, 5, consecrate yourselves for the Lord will do amazing things among you. By the way, I've lost track of time. I was going <laughs> to, I'm sorry if I go too long. I'll, I'll try to wrap this up and not go on forever. But um, the word hit me, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Because that was the word God was stirring in his heart. And the word God was stirring in my heart was consecrate. But then I just heard a word from uh, my friend who said, you know, if we focus, God is going to do great and mighty things. So that night I went to sleep and I had this dream. I never had a dream like this before. Um, it was, you know, it, it was in a moment where I was just about to wake up. It was kind of one of those moments where you're, you're asleep or you're not fully asleep. You're kind of in that zone. And I had this dream where I was with my wife. And she just called me and we sat on this table and she's like, James, I just have this peaceful sense of big things coming. And the moment she said that, the presence of God fell on her in the dream. She starts weeping. On my bed, I start shaking violently under the power of God. I woke up out of the dream still shaking, going, wow, what was that? But for me, it was a confirmation of the word that my friend Pastor Isaac, actually, he gave me a few days before and a connection to the word consecrate that I just heard the day before that. And, you know, I don't always have uh, crazy encounters like that where I feel like, wow, you know, you know, God's presence is just so heavy, I'm shaking or whatever. But I really feel like maybe God allowed that to happen to me to understand the gravity of the weight of the word that he was releasing, that this is not something to ignore. Because Becky's, Becky's words to me in the dream, which I, I believe was the voice of God to me in the dream was, there are big things ahead. And I want to declare that over this church. The best days are yet to come. I'm looking around here in the empty seats. The best days are yet to come. When people will be flocking into this place and there will be not enough seats for them to sit in. Revival breaking out in this city, I don't even think the churches are enough to cope with the numbers of people. So it's not just about our church, it's about what God wants to do across the region and across the nation. And I believe there are greater things ahead of us more than we realize. And I declare it to you personally, your best days are yet to come. God has greater things ahead of you more than you realize. It's not time to look at the past and think about, wow, how great that was and how great God used you there and how great God provided for you there. No, no, no. Look at the future and expect greater things. You know, in, in the book of Acts, it says, I'll pour my spirit in all flesh. Uh, Peter is quoting Joel. And I believe what happened in, on the day of Pentecost was a part fulfillment of the book of Joel. But in no way do I believe it's the fullness of the fulfillment of Joel. Because if you read Joel's prophecy and you read what happened in the book of Acts, only some things match up. Not the whole picture. There's still greater things that are yet to happen. Because God says, on all flesh. Not just a few people on all flesh. I don't know what that's going to look like, but it's going to look like something we haven't seen before. 
And the Bible also prophesies that the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. In other words, what God has done, I, I, I like to read about revivals and moves of God where God descends upon a region and people are repenting, turning to God without anyone talking to them about God. They feel the presence of God. And I'm like, wow, God, I want to see this. Or someone preaches a message and people are having visions of hell. People, unsaved people are having visions of hell and having to turn to God because they're like, wow, I can't just help but, you know, give my life to God. I mean, if you see hell, I tell you what, I don't care what kind of addiction you're in, you're going to want to serve God. You know, and I mean, these things have happened in revivals in, of past, you know, and I read about some of these things. And I go, wow, God, that's amazing. I don't even see things like that happen now. But I feel God saying, as amazing as you think that is, what is coming cannot even compare. What, what's happened cannot even compare to what's about to happen and what's coming. I'm saying these things to stir up your faith. But I believe God was speaking that word to me personally, but not just me personally. I, this word I'm sharing with you, I shared with a, a few people even at the message trust, that God is saying there's something ahead of us. And because of what's ahead of us, we have to prepare ourselves right now. God is not going to pour out his, his glory on a group of people that are not ready for it. I've just got a baby just this, okay? I'm not going to drop off my baby in your house, if I come into your house and you've got broken glass everywhere, needles everywhere, the stove left on, why would I drop my baby there? Because you're not showing me that you're ready for it. By your life and the way you've organized your life, you're not ready for what's precious to me. Why is God going to increase his glory upon his people when their lives are not conditioned and ready to have more of him? We sang it, we want more of you, set a fire down in my soul. We sang it, didn't we? We said, God, I want more of you. He's saying to you, I want more of you. You can't have more of God if you're not giving him more of you. Where is the more coming into? Your, your life is occupied by TV, by football games, by this social here, by this there and that there. And yet you want more of God. Where is the more coming to? To have more of God, you have to create time. Relationship is developed by fellowship. And if you want to go deeper in relationship with God, you can't just do it because you came to Sunday service or you said a prayer here or there. No, no, no. You have to give time to develop a relationship with God. It takes time to go deep in God. You can't go deep in God on the run. And I believe this word in Daniel. It says, those who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Those are the people that God is raising up right now. A new breed of believers. A new breed of evangelists, a new breed of prophets, a new breed of apostles is raising them up. You might not necessarily have a microphone to speak in front of people, but in your workplace, you're a prophet. In your workplace, you're an evangelist because God is raising you up and you're preparing that space in your life for more of God to come into so that when people meet you, they don't see you, they see God in you. Remember the story of when Jesus healed the lady with the issue of blood? The lady touched Jesus and what happened? Power flowed from Jesus to hit the lady. Jesus felt the power flow. He didn't even know who touched him. In other words, he didn't even have to have consent for the power to leave him. <laughs> the power left his body and hit the lady and she gets healed and she's excited. And Jesus says, who touched me? Who touched me? This is what I'm trying to bring out of this. Jesus' flesh was so thin that the power of God could flow through him when he was touched. So his flesh was not in the way of the power of God. When you lay hands on the sick, the reason why they get healed is because the power of God is flowing out of you into them. The question is, is your flesh in the way? Is your pride in the way? <laughs> is your own issues in the way? When the flesh is dead, that's why fasting is so powerful. Because when you fast, you quieten the appetites of the flesh and let the appetite of the spirit stir up so that God in you can come out of you and impact more people. Because you owe your generation the fire of God burning in you. You know, I say that to myself. I owe my generation the fire of God burning in me. Because when I'm not on fire for God, when they come around me, they're just going to impact, they're just going to they're just going to experience me. They're not going to experience the fire of God and the presence of God because I'm living in compromise. That's why I owe my generation the fire of God. So if I'm not living right for God, I'm robbing someone else with an experience with God. My life is not just isolated to me. There's a knock-on effect. You all have a sphere of influence. And this is the season where God is saying, do you not just think this is a job for the pastors? You have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to prepare yourself for what's about to happen. And I remember, you know, when I had this dream, the word just hit me, you know, consecrate. The word consecrate comes from the word, um, or the word holiness actually can be translated to consecrate. To consecrate, you have to separate. 
there has to be a disconnection for there to be a, conne- a deep connection to God. There has to be a dis- disconnection from external things and the drawings and the desires and the things of this flesh to connect in a deeper way with God. The best way to describe this is to look at athletes when they're preparing for the Olympics or for a major tournament. What do they do? They go on a very strict diet. They're very focused. Everyone else may be eating burgers, but they don't eat burgers. Because they're singing what's ahead of them. So you know what? They are consecrated onto their sports. They're set apart onto their sports. In other words, they can look at other people eating and say, no, others may, but I may not because I'm called to higher purposes. And right now, I'm not even talking about sin issues. I mean, that's a given. I'm talking about some of the things that are just eating up your time. And God is like, right now, I want you to go deeper in me, but your affections are taken away by other things. I always say it's impossible to fulfill the first commandment in its entirety. Love the Lord, go all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's impossible to fulfill that commandment and have uh, uh, the same level of intense devotion and love for 10 other things at the same time. You, you can't be intense at 10 things at once. You have to focus. And if you focus, it means you narrow down your life. And David is a, is a typical example of that. Paul is a typical example of that in the New Testament. He says, one thing I've desired of the Lord. He narrowed his life down to one thing. This is the time to disconnect from those things that are causing distractions. And actually, you know what they're doing? They're dampening your hunger and desire for God. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, well, I don't know what your life is like out there. But I'm not assuming a lot of us get drunk on wine necessarily. But we can be drunk on the pleasures of this world, on the pleasures of entertainment, on the pleasures of TV, on the pleasures of whatever, and we come into the presence of God and our desire level is low. Well, it's going to be low because you've not been feeding the desire. For desire to increase, you have to feed it. And if you want to grow deep in God, you can't afford to just let your life be based, your spiritual life be based on a Sunday meeting or even just the house group meeting. You've got to make up your mind, God, and this is my heart cry, God, I'm not after a greater platform to preach. I'm not after, I just want to be a man of prayer that goes deep in God because I know from that place I can impact the world. When I move the heart of heaven, heaven can move the heart of man. I'm not interested in just moving men when I preach. I always say, you know, when I preach, I can move men and women, but when I pray, I can move angels and demons. And I want to move angels and demons over regions, but I know that's not going to happen just by accident. I have to position myself to go after God with all my might, with all my soul, with all my strength, because that is all, that's all I want in life. People, that is all I want. You can ask my wife. You can ask anyone who knows me. That is all I want in this life. I just want to know God. I think it's unfair that Moses could walk face to face with God in the Old Testament, and he had less in a sense that he wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. And in the New Testament, we're very comfortable We're just having a church service. I am not okay with that. I have got to see him face. I've got to walk deeper with him. I want to know him like Paul did. I want to know him even more than Paul did. And that kind of hunger, you have to feed it. And it has to translate into action. And God is saying to me in this season, I believe in saying to us, set yourselves apart. Consecrate yourself like the athletes. Don't compare yourselves to other Christians. Ask God, how can I consecrate myself to you in this season? What does it look like? Well, it might mean less TV. I'm not saying this is it. It might mean less TV. It might mean instead of going out and hanging out with that person, get in your room and read your Bible and pray. It might mean, because Evan Roberts did that for 13 years. No one knew his name. Evan Roberts, who led the Welsh Revival in 1904, at the age of 13, someone said to him, never miss a prayer meeting because that could be the meeting where God decides to break out and part of the Spirit. At the age of 13, he starts going to meetings and seeking God, prayer meetings, whatever. 13 years later, God says, now is the time I'm going to use you to release a greater point of my spirit. Why? Because 13 years previous to that, he'd been faithful in seeking God. And God had been digging a deep well in him so that when the masses came, his flesh was not in the way, but God could be released through him. He had a secret history of God. What is your secret history of God? I don't want to meet God on the last day. Look into his eyes. And those eyes look very unfamiliar to me. I don't look into his eyes knowing that I've, behold, I've beheld those eyes every day. When I seek him, when we sing this song, I'm looking into those eyes in my heart. And I'm saying, God, I've got to know you. I'm not satisfied where I'm at right now. One of the greatest uh, weapons the enemy has against us, I feel it a lot, is complacency. 
you just, you just coast along. You know, you just come to church, just sing a song here or there, just go back home and just do your life. And, you know, there is no hunger. By default, if you do nothing, you backslide. Do you realize that? It's like trying to swim against the tide. Okay, if you try to swim against the tide and it's coming downstream 20 stream, uh, sorry, 20 miles an hour, by the way, I just learned how to swim on my honeymoon. <laughs> but I can only swim underwater because I'm told black people can't float. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. <laughs> but the point is, if you're trying to swim upstream and you're swimming against the tide, it's coming at you at 20 miles an hour and you're trying to swim against it, if you do nothing by default, you get swept away. If you swim at 20 miles an hour, in terms of the force you apply against the, the, the tide is the same force which is coming against you. By default, you remain in the same position. To make progress, you have to exert a force that's greater than the opposition you're facing. And the darkness is great. I said it before. In other words, this is the hour that the violent take it by force. And it's not physical violence, it's spiritual violence, saying, God, I'm going to have all that, you've, all that you've purposed for me to walk in on this earth. I am going to walk in it. I just don't want to know it as theology. I want to know it as reality. Okay, if you can turn to this passage. Look at me, I've got this in pocket. <laughs> I said to my wife, <laughs> I said to my wife, I said, I need some tissue. I think I'm going to sweat. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, so turn to Genesis 12, verse 1 through 3. I'll just bring out a few things from this. Um, Genesis 12, from, uh, verse 1 to 3. Now, um, this is God speaking to Abraham. Actually, before I read this, a couple of statements I want to make. When God has a special mission, he puts a demand on a life for a special lifestyle. Because to fulfill the mission of God, you have to live the way God wants you. To fulfill the mission of God in its fullness, you can't just do anything you want. Actually, your life becomes restrained in a certain sense. And, um, you know, it said that the anointing breaks the yoke. But actually, the lifestyle that brings the anointing, that breaks the yoke. There's a lifestyle behind the anointing that flows, that God is requiring of the people who are meant to carry that anointing. Samson um, was able to take the jawbone of a donkey, of a donkey to kill 1,000 people. You might look at that, and I look at that, excuse me, and I think, wow, that's amazing. How could one man take the jawbone of a donkey and kill 1,000 people? I mean, there's not even 1,000 people here in this room. But it's just an amazing thing to think of. And we can easily celebrate his success outwardly without realizing that his vow as a Nazarite was that he was not meant to touch a dead thing. So in the church today, sometimes we can focus so much on the externals, we ignore the internals. In other words, if you're successful enough, it doesn't matter that the, uh, that the tool you're using to bring your success is the trophy of your broken vow, Samson. This is a season where God is calling us, again, the whole theme of consecration, to not think because things look okay on the outside and everything is okay before people, God is okay with us. Actually, you can't judge um, God's pleasure with you by how impactful your ministry is. Because Samson had an impactful ministry, but his lifestyle was not lining up to the calling. What actually determines the depth of connection you have with God is when you're alone by God, is the intimacy. You can never fake intimacy. And when you're not right with God, you know it. And this is a season where God is saying, I want to realign you because there's a lot more I want to do through you. And I don't want to get distracted by those things that I do through you and think, wow, God is using me in this way. I must be really anointed or God really approves of my lifestyle when you know you're living in compromise. But then when you get alone before God, there's no internal connection with God. I'm not interested in preaching before the masses, going home on my own and having no internal connection with God. Because that happens. Your ministry can grow on the outside and your heart shrinks on the inside. And God is calling us to be people with big hearts. So now this passage... In uh, Genesis 1, uh, sorry, Genesis 12, 3 to 1, God says to Abraham, 
Now the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. And in, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Notice God's first words to him. Get out of your country. See? Notice that increase does not come until we get on the other side of separation. There's some things God will not move you into until you are out of what he called you out of. Abraham had to be disconnected from the current system he was in to step into the newness that God had for him. See, there's got to, we've, we've got to get to a place of consecration and disconnection. If there's going to be a place of, if we're going to step into a place of real elevation into God's next dimension. I'll say that again. We've got to step into a place of consecration. Excuse me. We've got to step into a place of consecration and disconnection if there's going to be any real elevation into God's next dimension. It's just not going to happen. God has a time plan. God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has something he's working out in this nation right now. God has an opinion on what's going on in the church right now. In the whole of the UK, God has an opinion. And God also has a plan who are the people who are wanting to know God's plan for the church in the nation? Who are the people who are seeking to know God's plan for the nation, not just the church, but for God's purposes in the land? Those people have got to step into this place of disconnection from the system to connect with the deep things that God wants to reveal to them. Deep calls unto deep, right? If deep calls unto deep, it means shallow calls unto shallow. To step into the deep things of God, you have to disconnect yourself from the shallow things of EastEnders. Every, every day trying to catch up on what they say. Well, you don't need to know what's happening on there. And many times, a lot of times, it's just junk. Okay. Thank you, Dom. <laughs> I'm not against TV, by the way. I do have a TV in my house. I'm just against things that are discipling the people of God with the ways of darkness. And we're taking it in and thinking it's okay and God is okay with it. God is not okay with the fact that you're watching certain movies. Because those movies are not pleasing. Actually, Holy Spirit takes a step out when you put on those movies. Because it's, it's not comfortable. And it's like, why are you doing this? And you're quenching the desire for God. The environment you're creating is not conducive for the Holy Spirit to remain in. And you know what? There's a difference between, I, I believe there's a difference between holiness and righteousness. Because righteousness in 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, uh, we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might be made the righteousness. And we know righteousness is a gift of God. It puts us in the right standing of God. So when God looks at us, he sees Jesus and the price Jesus paid. And I like to look at it like this. Righteousness is almost like a cloak, a cloak of righteousness we've been given. How we take care of that is what holiness is. If you're wearing a white gown, you're not just going to sit anywhere. You're gonna, and you're, if you're wearing a white gown and, very, and you're very cautious about getting it stained, you're going to be careful where you go. You're going to be careful what you watch. You're going to be careful, you know, you, you're going to be careful of protecting the position and what you've been blessed with. Are, are you with me? It's that process I see as holiness. It's God's responsibility given to us to take care of what he's blessed us with. We can't just do it. Listen. It's important even what you post online. I, I get quite upset sometimes because my wife knows I'm looking at some people's Facebook status and some people's Twitter feed. I'm thinking, are you really a Christian? It's shocking what some people post online and they come to church and it's like, I'm like, I can't believe this. Do you know people of the world are looking to you? You might not stand on a platform, but you have a platform with your Twitter. You have a platform with your Facebook and what you post on there can influence the people of the world. You cannot just post anything. <laughs> I am big on that. <laughs> I, because I, I think Christians, people should look at us and say, wow, you look like Christ. People should look at our Facebook pages and go, you know, what's that? What's that? What's that? You know, it's just kind of like, this is no, I'm not saying every post you make has to be, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm saying just the image you're portraying, it's important that people are looking at you and seeing Christ. You know? Okay, anyway, I'll move on. <laughs> so, Abraham has to disconnect from the system. I'm going to make this uh, last point with Abraham, and this is where I'm going to end this. Um, 
Now, think about the fact that the children of Israel, it took them 40 years to do a journey that could have taken them 11 days because God could not get them to disconnect from the ideologies of their former bondage. In order for them to step into the promised land, they had to be, Egypt had to be got out of them. All the ideologies, in fact, none of them made it into the promised land, apart from Caleb and Joshua, because they had a different mindset. Now, Abraham is one of those people we look at in scripture, and he's like a father of the faith. And Abraham started out being called Abraham. And then God adds an addendum to his name, Ham. Okay. And if you look back before Abraham comes on the scene, excuse me. Ham is one of the three sons of Noah. He has uh, Sham, Japheth, and Ham. And Noah gets drunk, okay? He's laying in his, in his place, and Ham walks in. According to Genesis 9.22, it says, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. And he told his two brothers. Now, the word saw in Hebrew is reha. And you know what that word means? It means to stare intently with joyous desire. That's gross. <laughs> So Ham saw his father's nakedness, but he wasn't just saw his father's nakedness. There was something, per, uh, uh, there, was something uh, uh, there was a perversion going on in his heart when he saw his father's nakedness, okay? And think about the fact that his father was drunk. So he, uh, evil desires were stirred up in Ham because of his father's failure to live according to biblical principles, you know what, where I'm going with this? <laughs> My decisions are consequential on the next generation. I can't just do whatever I want to do. I've got a next generation being raised up. And if I'm walking in the, lo- in the wrong path, I'm influencing them in a negative way, whether I know it or not. And uh, Noah gets drunk and... Uh, He wakes up, and uh, he finds out what's happened, okay? This is quite interesting, because Noah finds out what's happened, and he speaks a curse. He speaks a curse, and the curse he spoke was not over Ham, but was over Canaan. What is Canaan? Canaan is what we know today as the promised land, but Canaan was also Ham's son, Noah did not put a curse on Ham. Even though Ham was the one who had the perverted behavior, Noah put a curse on on Canaan. And we also know that Ham had perversion in his heart because if you read the genealogies and you see, you see the, the land that came under Ham's government became Sodom and Gomorrah. What one generation does in moderation, the next generation will do in excess. The compromise of one generation will become the captivity of the next generation. If I don't choose to walk in freedom in my life and pure before God, I am creating an opportunity for captivity in the lives of my son. That's why many times there can be almost seemingly connections and behavioral patterns transferring from parents to children, and it just keeps going on. And what I find interesting about this is Canaan was the cursed land because of Ham's perversion. But now, today in the church, we know Canaan as the promised land. So the question is, how does the cursed land become the promised land? Well, God raises up a covenant man and changes his name because it disconnects him from the system he was in and adds an addendum to his name called Ham. What Ham forfeited, Abraham regained, and Abraham, became, uh, Abraham, Abraham stood in a position to inherit the fullness of the promise that Ham forfeited. So the cursed land became the blessed land because Abraham rose up as a covenant man to change the system he was in. Are you with me? I don't care the family history you've had. Whether there's been curses and whether people have been living drunken lifestyles and promiscuous lifestyles, you are a covenant person. And if you will live the life, if you will live the life of disconnection from the system, 
You stand in a place of authority to transform that curse to the greatest blessing your family has ever known. <laughs> in your workplace, you are a covenant person. And God is calling to be in that place to transform the system. You're called to be a thermostat, not a thermometer. You're not called to conform to the temperature. You're called to shift the temperature. And you can only do that when you know who you are in Christ. You are a covenant person. It's the season, it's the time for you to disconnect from all the distractions because there's a great inheritance ahead of you. Because of Abraham's decisions and Abraham's obedience, we're here today. Because he chose to disconnect. And some of it was painful. Circumcision is painful. And it has to go through a cutting away of the flesh. Sometimes the things God cuts away are not necessarily bad. I remember when I was in America in 2007 and God told me to lay down relationships. I'd never been in a relationship apart from my wife before I got married. And God said to me, you know, I just want you to lay this down. For five years, I, I want you to not even think about this and that. And I was like, what's this about? You know, why? You know, but I didn't realize God was calling me to a place of consecration at that time. Our effectiveness in the heavens in prayer is directly related to our consecrations on the earth. When we set ourselves apart to God, we position ourselves to walk in greater realms of authority, more than we realize. You don't have to rebuke a demon. Jesus' presence caused demons to manifest because he lived a holy lifestyle. When was the last time a demon manifested because he walked in the room? <laughs> I mean, that hasn't happened to me yet, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> My point is, my lifestyle has an impact even on the spiritual atmosphere around me. It, the decisions I make impact things I do not see. Think of if Abraham was not obedient to God. God who, I'm sure God would have raised up somebody else. But think about what he would have missed out on. And I want to challenge you today. God has great things in store for you. God has great things in store for this church, but I do not believe that's just going to happen like that. If we just carry on the way we have been, the word of the Lord for me, for us, I believe, is consecrate yourselves to God. Set yourself apart. Do you want to stand with me? And can the band come up? And we're going to pray.